welcome to the Light and Energy Show with me, Claire Wiles. We're here today in the wonderful town of Glastonbury in Somerset with two very special people. We've got John and Anthony with us. John, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Yes, uh, my name is John Wadsworth. I'm an astrologer and I live here in Glastonbury. And I've been working as a professional astrologer for about 20 years. Uh -huh. And um, out of that work and out of my experience working with the zodiac, with, with the planets, with astrology, I created something called the Alchemical Journey, which has now been running for three years. And we take people around the zodiac, around the year, around the astrological year through the seasons. And we experience ourselves and our lives through these 12 archetypal perspectives represented by the 12 signs of the zodiac. So if you can imagine, we spend a whole weekend being Aries, being Rams, a whole weekend being Taurian bulls, a whole weekend being Geminis, a whole weekend being Cancerians. Regardless of what our, our sun sign, our star sign is, we, we work, work on the basis that we carry all 12 of these within us and that we can tap the magic and the transformational power of each one. And that's what we do. And we do it through, in all sorts of ways, we use music and uh, movement, imagery, guided visualization and meditation, and we walk in the landscape. And I guess that's where Anthony comes in. Yeah, I'm Anthony and um, I, my kind of thing really is the landscape. And um, I've been interested in sacred landscape and the energies in the landscape for 30 years, the history, the background, the myths, the traditions, all that kind of thing. And here in Glastonbury, this is a completely unique landscape because uh, as well as the myths and the history of Jesus Christ coming here and King Arthur dying here and goodness knows what, rows of saints and goodness knows, extraordinary kind of landscape, there is the famous Glastonbury landscape zodiac. And this is an extraordinary um, 12 miles across um, uh, sort of picture of the various signs of the zodiac found in the field patterns and the ways the rivers run and all the rest of it. So you can look down from the sky and literally see a living zodiac on the ground. And the fascinating thing is that each of these signs, some of which are several miles across, if you walk in them and if you go to these places, like if you're walking on the, the Leo sign for um, the lion, uh, that part of the year, you'll find all kinds of extraordinary representations and coincidences and synchronicities of lionness. There'll be lion stories and houses named after lions and pubs called the Red Lion, and it keeps whirling up out of the ground until you start to realise there's something very magical going on here. So you can imagine if you've spent a whole day working yourself up into all the complexities and fascinations in the sign of Leo in the first day of our workshop, then you go out into the landscape and you're walking in the very energy of this sign. And we do very much parts of the walk in complete silence. So you just have to absorb, you know, what's going on. Um, by the end of that weekend, people just change. And that's what we're about, isn't it? Fantastic. And uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about that later on. We're starting here at the Abbey. Um, John, could you tell us why we've actually started at the Abbey for our, our show today? Well, this is a this is a remarkable place um, in Glastonbury. It's a it's a, um, thought by many to be the 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 the, the, fir the the birthplace of Christianity in many ways because it's the, the first church of Christendom is thought to have first been built here uh, by Joseph of Arimathea, and it's thought even that maybe Jesus came here as well. There's a strong tradition of Jesus coming here um, in his in his youth, and. It's a, it's a place that, that carries a certain energy and the, the, um, the, the well-known Michael Ley Line runs right through the middle of the Abbey down here and right through the, the house behind the Abbey House here. And, um, and so it, it, it carries a, a, a special charge to it. And uh, there are many sacred places here in Glastonbury, but this is perhaps the, the most sacred. And uh, here it is, um, the ruin of the Abbey behind us. Do you want to add any more? Um, no, it is a very special place. I mean, there's an energy line which literally is crossing the grass here, just behind a tree, and goes down through the centre of the abbey. As John said, it's, it's the Michael, sometimes called the Michael Mary line. It runs all the way from the coast on, at East Anglia, diagonally across England, passing through many, many Michael and Mary de dedicated churches, and it goes all the way to St Michael's Mount in, in, in Cornwall. And it's one of the most extraordinary things, which of course I suppose 
archaeologists and scientists would find a lot of difficulty with. But dowsers and sensitive people can pick this up. It's got healing energy, it's got transformational energy, and it just so happens to pass through this retreat house here and through down the lawn here. So as John says, we're in a very, very special place, a unique place in Britain, really. And it's, uh, can I say one more thing? It's, it's also on the Aquarius figure in the landscape zodiac yeah. as well. So this is the... Um, so we're actually on the, on the zodiac here yeah. in this point as well. I mean, yeah. if, if you think of Aquarius as the sign which is associated with the kind of the coming new age or whatever you want to call it and all the transformations of consciousness and ideas that's been going on probably for 150 years already. And if you think of Glastonbury as a place full of very radical alternative living people, you know, with lots of different faiths, lots of different spiritual traditions, lots of different kinds of experiment in um, social community and all that kind of thing going on here. Only 7,000 people here, but probably this is the most radical, forward-looking community in the whole of the United Kingdom. And it's on the Aquarius sign of the Glastonbury Zodiac, dead on. Yes, that's, uh, that's quite amazing, isn't it? Well, we're going to go inside now to somewhere a little bit warmer and less windy to continue our show. So, John, if I could ask you first, can you just tell us a little bit about the concepts of, ast of astrology? Um, yeah, well, uh, astrology is, very, um, is, is conceived and understood very differently by, by, by different people. For some, it's a science, an ancient science. Um, for some, it's more, a, 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 more like an art, more like a divinatory art. And that's mm -hmm. weirdly where I'm coming from in astrology. I see it much more in, a, in, in, in its divinatory artistic sense. And, you know, it has, a, it has an incredibly long tradition. People don't always realize what a long tradition astrology has. You know, the first things that were ever written down made reference to the stars and planets. And so, you know, we're, we're, when we enter in as astrologers, we're entering into a very ancient tradition that obviously has been through all sorts of changes and... And it, and it changes as the philosophy and cosmology changes as well. But it, it retains, I think, something of the magical sense, that sense of enchantment mm. or magic that we've lost in our modern culture. And I think that's why even people who go, oh, yeah, I don't believe in astrology, they'll still kind of flip to the back pages mm. of the newspaper and have a look because there's some part of them that's, that, that remembers a connection and remembers that everything is connected as well. Astrology reminds us of several things. It reminds us that we're, that, that, that we're all interconnected, the above and the below. Mm. It reminds us that we carry an understanding. I, I, mean, I, I really work on the basis that astrology is not something that you learn like another subject. It's something that you actually remember. Okay. When, I, when I teach astrology, it's like I'm helping people to remember something that they already know. Mm. And through connecting to it, it sort of reveals all sorts of potentials, potentials within mm. the human spirit. The, it, it, it reminds people of what they could do in their life. Okay. Rather than telling them what will happen, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't go down the line that astrology is, mm. is a predictive... Um, it, I, it's not predictive in the, fate, in the fatalistic sense. I don't think that it will. That it will say this. You know, this is definitely going to happen. But what, what it will is, it will. What it will do is, it will put you back in touch with the cycles of nature, the cycles of life, and it will. It might indicate when is a good time to do something. When the when when is a more favourable time to do something. It might. It can highlight very well issues and challenges that are particular to an individual based on the configuration of their birth chart. So it's, uh, it's really good as a self-empowerment tool. Very good, yeah. Mm. It's very good for, 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 for self-realisation, yeah. for, for self-understanding. Yeah. In quite a fluid way. I think yeah. astrology is quite a fluid thing, and I think it's the way that we participate with the symbolism of astrology mm. that really gives, gives um, it its power and gives us a certain power in, in, of understanding and, 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 and realisation. Mm. And I think that it, when we when we recover that understanding, it, it just it opens up possibilities in our lives. And really, that's the basis of the alchemical journey: is that we can, is that by entering into the mystery of the zodiac, which is the basic, you know, the, the basis of astrology is the zodiac and, and and the way that the planets move through the zodiac. Mm. But by working with the zodiac, it's like we can recover these different aspects of life we can we can connect back to nature to the seasons to the cycles of life that in our in our speeded up very linear kind of world 
we've lost touch with. Astrology puts us back in touch with the cycle. Mm. And that's really interesting, isn't it, with this change in consciousness that's happening and yeah. people are wanting to be much more in tune now with nature. And I love the idea of, um, of the fact that this is stuff that we knew that we're just bringing to the fore again, rather than stuff that we're learning. Um, I often find with, with things that I do uh, within my own personal journey in life that things come so naturally. So it's it's like a knowledge that you did exactly forget you had and somebody's just reminding you of it. So, Anthony, where, where do you fit into this? Well, first of all, I mean, I, I fit into it because the philosophy, broad philosophy, which John's just talked about, um, I very much hold to. I'm not a practicing astrologer, but I know a lot about astrology, and I've studied it for years. And I think it's just fascinating that, you know, a particular time of in, in existence can be put onto a sheet. You know, we call it a chart, a birth chart, or a, a chart for a particular kind of time, like it might be a question you're going to ask about my life. Should I go down this track or that track? So you go to see an astrologer, and you get a chart done. And on that piece of paper is a capacity for a, a skilled astrologer to... Um, you know, make a lot of very, very interesting and insightful comments about the past in your life, the future in your life, the present, and and kind of paint for you some of the options that you've got in the way of choices, which I think is just remarkable that, that there can be a map of such complexity. I mean, it really begs the question about, you know, cause and effect. It, bas it asks some very, very fundamental, quite philosophical questions about existence. This capacity of astrology to somehow either penetrate time and space is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And then on the alchemical journey, we find, as John's already hinted, that people seem to carry this information in them innately, like as if it's almost hardwired. Now, that's a dangerous thing to say, but, you know, it's almost as if um, they have a kind of pre-understanding um, out of what, I don't know. But, I mean, if you uh, expose people to a particular sign of the zodiac, I mean, let's mention Leo again, you might find that people very quickly kind of find Leo bits in them they didn't know they had, have Leo-type understanding, so they're quite shocked and say, I, I knew a lot more about this than I realised. I've never opened a book, I'm not an astrologer, how would I know about Leo so much? Then, take them for a a pretty meaty walk in the landscape, in the Leo landscape, and the even more of this material is coming out. And so it's a kind of almost magical process beyond sort of rational explanation. Neither of us are trying to rationally explain mm. it. What we are doing, though, is seeing how powerfully transformative it is and exposing people to it. I mean, I, I don't want to make that sound clinical, not exposing them in a sort of technical sense, but giving the opportunity of experiencing it firsthand because we know that with the right kind of guidance and care, and no pushing, no prodding, no psychologising. Mm. I'm an ex-psychiatrist and John's got lots of insight as a, um, uh, a life coach and counsellor. We could really, you know, say all kinds of things and we never say them. Mm. We just leave people in the space of the potential for their own growth. Mm. And they grow. Mm. That's very powerful. So... Do you think this was the sort of thing that the ancients would have done with the alignment of stones and the alignment of barrows, that they were tapping into this at that time? And, and this is a, a, a journey that's perhaps come from, from hundreds of thousands of years brought forward to now. I, I think there is a very important point you're making there. If you take the idea of pilgrimage, which is a long and arduous journey taken on foot, with a spiritual goal in the sense you're going to a cathedral or a sacred place or to a shrine of somebody or other. And it might take weeks or years, if it's like Mecca or whatever. You might take a long time going there. But it's the journey that matters. Mm -hmm. It's the actual journey. It's the ardour of, um, you know, having to deal with stony hillsides, no food, running out of water, getting robbed on the way and all this kind of stuff. And when you take the Canterbury Pilgrims, the idea of the stories, what the, they walked all day, and you never hear about that in the Canterbury Tales. What you hear about is in the evenings, in the, the inns or around the, the fireside, somebody tells a story. And in medieval times, there was no psychology, there was no understanding of conscious and unconscious and all the stuff that we have today and worry about so much. They didn't have a psychology. What they could do is tell tales. 
They were stories, but they carried archetypes in the stories. They carried essential psychological truths, not noted by them as psychology, no psychology then, but just simply the, the stories. And you would listen to the good wife of Bath's tale, the pardoner's tale, the knight's tale, and you'd come out of those experiences taking a little bit, giving a little bit, identifying, go to sleep, probably a bit drunk, wake up in the morning, back on the road, four days to get to Canterbury and four days of transformation. And I see the Canterbury Tales very much as a very early medieval example of a kind of alchemical journey, but nobody's ever written it up like that, I mean academically. Yeah. But that's really what's happening. We never hear what happens to the pilgrims when they get to Canterbury. Do they look at the steps where Thomas of Becket was murdered, which is what it's all about? Mm. We don't know anything about them. But we have enshrined in our literary tradition those powerful stories. Well, in a kind of way, what we do is all about stories and narrative and, and life change. And it's the journey that matters, not the end point. Mm. I think when there's so much emphasis in our culture on, on end points, on mm. the way that, you know, <clears throat> what's, going, what's the outcome of this going to be? To actually allow people to relax into a journey mm. and to experience each step of that mm. and, and the transformational the power. Mm. Exactly. And to enjoy mm. it and to... And because we, because we take a whole year to go around the Zodiac, you know, people mm. have time then to absorb each month all mm. the many insights and, mm. and, and ideas that come to them. And I think one of the most exciting things for me, and we have, a, have an opportunity to, to, to meet some of the people who've, who've, done, who've done the journey, um, one of the most exciting things really is the, is, is the creativity that seems to stir mm. in the participants, mm. people who've come on the journey with us over mm. the three years that we've been doing it. Um, and, and, and it's extraordinary how this latent creative potential suddenly mm. explodes out of out of people's participation in, in the course. And I think this this relationship to um, to imagination and creativity and storytelling, I think when when, when you can tap astrology at that level, tap the poetry, mm. the music, mm. the imagery mm. that lies there, the mythology, out of that comes a, a kind of a, a a kind of revelation of, of, of a person's um, passion and creativity. Mm. And that's it's, very exciting. It's a real sort of sensory awakening, mm -hmm. in, in a way. I think so. It's very experiential. I mean, the whole experience of the alchemical journey, it's experiential. It's not chalk and talk. It's not about instruction mm. at all. It's about allowing people to kind of step into interesting experiences like music, dance, craft, making mm. things. Um, you know, telling stories, sharing things, and so on. And it's very, very much the experience that we're always um, asking people to share with us or, or explore in themselves. And as John's already hinted at, this sort of interaction of imagination and experience and a little bit of knowledge and maybe this hardwired element, it's a very powerful combination. And it's, it's very exciting to see people changing. And this creativity that comes out, uh, in people is, is, is something absolutely wonderful. I want to mention one thing though, just because I think John may be shy about saying it. He is absolutely brilliant at choosing the right kinds of music to dance to in a kind of astro theatre situation. Perhaps John will tell you more about this himself, but it is a wonderful kind of way in which we can help people get into some more specific bits of their own astrology. I think John yeah, we, do, we do work, I mean, although it's not an astrology course, the Alchemical Journey, I, mean, mm. I do teach astrology and I've been practicing mm. astrology for years, interpreting people's charts, but the Alchemical Journey is not an interpretive process, as mm. Anthony's already said. It's not, we're not interpreting people's charts. However, we do work with people's charts. So, inter so, so obviously, interpretation and meaning does occur but rather than me just take the chart and, 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 and interpret it for them, I choose music, choose pieces of music that I think mm. might express the archetype mm. that we're working with in that month that's relevant to their birth chart. And through, and through the music and dance, and we, use, and, and, and we use costumes sometimes and masks and bits of theatre, we actually explore in the moment, spontaneously, through our own feeling mm. how that person's Mars or Venus mm. or mm. Moon or Neptune might express itself. Mm. And something happens in that process that is quite magical. Mm. And well, even though nothing's been said really, 
the revelation of a deep meaning mm. that can be transformational and healing mm. and very powerful can can come out just of that experience. So, and yeah. what we what we tend to forget, remembering that this is an al- a, 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 an astrological journey round the twelve signs, is that what we all as individuals tend to forget is that um, we have the rest of the chart. Mm. Um, for instance, you know, I'm a Pisces, and therefore, you know, that's it. And the other 11 signs, why do I care about them? I'm a Pisces. You look up in the newspaper, the Pisces bit. You don't read the other bits because they're not relevant for you. When you do the alchemical journey, if you do the Pisces weekend, which we've indeed just done, you're going to then go to the next weekend, uh, which is going to be in a few weeks' time, in Aries, and start the traditional route around the whole um, circle again. Supposing I'd say, well, I don't feel anything about Aries because I'm a Pisces. It happens that John's an Aries, and I know him very well, so I know quite a lot about what Aries people are like now, and he will know quite a lot about what Pisces people are like because he knows me. But the interesting thing is that I do the weekend for Aries, and I suddenly discover that I've got Aries in my chart as well. Which bit of my life is it operating in mostly? And it's a real revelation and a discovery. And then you think, wow, I'll go on and do the next weekend. And so you do Taurus, and then you found, wow, I've got Taurus bits in me. And by the time you've done all 12 of them, wow, what an enrichment of your own insight in your own life. Mm. Rather than think, well, I can't do that because I'm not a Virgo, you think, oh, yes, I have got Virgo in that part of my chart. I'm very Virgo in that part of my life, Mm. even if the rest of my life I'm not very Virgo. Mm. So it helps you really have a fulsome view of your own potential, your own personality, your own prospects in a very, very powerful way. Mm. And that's quite subtle. It's quite a difficult thing to put in a kind of strap line on the web, as it were, to explain what mm. the alchemical journey is. Mm. But I would say that's the guts of it, really. You get this huge enrichening of your own kind of life mm. through doing all 12 parts. Mm. And one of the final thing bits which I love is that um, John and I have often thought about this. If, um, you know, you've got 12 signs and they all represent different aspects of the human personality as it were now what's missing and you look all around them and you look all around them again and you think hmm can't really think of anything that's missing if you take one out immediately you've got to fill that with something to make it work you can't do without a leo you can't do without a pisces mm. type of people and so on but do you need any more is there a 13th a 14th a 15th not that we what not that we need all psychology is there mm. in those 12 aspects. A sense of completeness. A completeness. Yeah. And that 12 mm. is something which I know John is particularly very fascinated by, but we both are. It's a very canonical number. It goes right back into ancient traditions, mystery traditions, 12 And you know why? I mean, we could split the ecliptic. That's the constellations that the sun seems to move through from the earth. You know, the 12 mm. signs that we go through. After all, the Mesopotamians had 18. Other people have had 11 at different times, you know. We've now got 12. It's interesting, though, um, that 12 comes out because we could split those stars up into as many as mm. we wanted. Mm. But it comes out at 12. It comes and 12 out is tw- this number of yeah. harmony yes. and completeness yeah. yes. that, exactly. that, that, that different traditions all over the world have recognized. You know, yeah. you find it in the Christian <clears throat> tradition, the, in Judaism with the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah. You see it in Islamic traditions mm-hmm. as well. And, and this 12-ness seems to pervade and it, it seems to pervade these these cultures, and it and it connects, I think, to something to a harmony within us. Mm. And I think this idea of balance and harmony is at the is at the core of this. Mm. Yeah. And do you think at this moment in time, people are actually looking for this balance and harmony, perhaps more so than they did a hundred years ago? Maybe more than ever. Yeah. Mm. And I think I think astrology can actually provide a map mm. now. I think a lot of people mm. are turning to astrology now precisely because it's like, well, you know. Where 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 are the, where's the map? Is it all just chaotic, random? Mm. Astrology actually reminds us that that there might be an order mm. underlying things. There might be a way of making sense of mm. of this um, speeded up situation that we seem to be facing in the world. And I think that 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 this may be a way of transitioning through these challenging times that we find ourselves in in the world. You know that astrology mm. can be a really powerful and helpful and 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 and, and really useful map. And even the even the order of the signs, you know, starting off with Aries and then going to Taurus, which is an Earth sign, and then going on to you know Gemini, 
which is an, uh, um, an air sign, and then you know going on to Cancer, which is a water sign. So you go through the elements in that kind of way. In the and then that pattern repeats itself three times, and by the time you've kind of done your third um, Earth sign, you've really learned all these different facets of Earth, mm. and even the way that. Um, I mean, John's much better at explaining this than I am. Perhaps you ought to say this. You know, the kind of pattern that you start off with Aries and then you go to Taurus. You just explain that because it's so good. When well, yeah, I mean, each it. each sign kind of... I mean, I, I think using the analogy of the season is a really mm. is a really good way of, of understanding the zodiac. I and mean, we work mm. with that very explicitly. So Aries is like the first buds in nature. Taurus then is like the blossom mm. in May. Um, the blossom attracts the bees and butterflies, and then in Gemini you get the pollination cycle, and so mm. on it goes around the year. In Virgo you have the harvest, in uh, in 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 Libra, the the the, the colours change and the mm. beauty of, mm. is revealed, you know, yeah. in that in that autumn time. And yeah. and so I think it's a it's a great way of of people who don't know about astrology being able to access the symbolism through their own experiences in mm. in nature. You know, in Capricorn we have the wind at the winter solstice, you know, we have to be prepared and ready for the winter mm. and, you know, we're much more strategic at that point and mm. and so on. And and, and 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 there are so many levels at which astrology mm. works. You can see it through the body. Aries with the uh, the head, Pisces at the feet and all the body parts corresponding to the to the signs of zodiac, mm. Libra with the kidneys, the, the balancing mm. organs in the body, and you can, again, these are all ways of understanding and mm. and and making correspondences. Astrology is really based in the principle of correspondences, mm. that one thing is like another, and that at some at some level, metaphorically, one thing is another. You know that in poetry, when mm. it's that idea that that you know that that the that the sun looks like gold, it shines like gold, but at some level it is gold. That's an alchemical principle, that the sun mm. is mm. gold. Mm. But they partake somehow of the same essence. Mm. The moon is silver, and so on. And, yeah. and this, and I think that's where, that's where it, it's, astrology starts to penetrate a kind of, um, a, a kind of deep poetry, yeah. a transformational kind of poetry, and that's what interests me. In a way that interests me a lot more than the than, than, than trying to prove astrology scientifically, which I think is a, mm. might be a bit of a red herring, but I think that that to, if we can let go of the idea that we have to prove it within a within a modern rational mm. scientific framework mm. and accept mm. the, the, the the poetry mm. of astrology and the poetry mm. of the zodiac and the poetry of the planets and the enchantment of just looking up in the sky. Mm. Um, one of the things I do is I run a I run a mobile planetarium and and, and re remind people of this wonderful sky mm -hmm. that we have and then if when possible take them out on a starry night mm -hmm. show them the sky and it's like wow I'd forgotten that was there you know <laughs> because there's so much light pollution and our buildings yes. are so high and yeah. you know and we don't see the sky we live in a fairly cloudy country as well so mm -hmm. but just to be reminded of that that you know the sky mm -hmm. that is half of our visual mm -hmm. field. Mm. And it gives you a sense of connectedness with right. all that is, doesn't uh, it? And those connect, that connectedness, that sort of what John's called correspondences, where one thing is in a kind of way another. So, you know, the top of the head is um, Aries and the, and the feet are Pisces and the, the kidneys, you know, is, are Libra. And you get these connections and correspondences, coincidences, synchronicities and um, the alchemical journey is full of natural synchronicities. They happen in the landscape. You bump into people who are just the very thing you were asking a question about. There's all those kind of experiences happen for all the participants. So this kind of energy of the alchemical journey generates those synchronicities. It opens up those portals into other opportunities through the connections which is what everybody is really asking for today in a very powerful way so this is a wonderful vehicle for self-discovery and finding out about those things that you never imagined you could dare imagine mm. you know it's wonderful we're going to uh, have a little word now with some of the participants from the course and they're going to tell us their experiences and and how the alchemical journey has affected them and enhance their creativity Hi Colette, thanks so much for joining us. Have you done all 12 cycles of the alchemical journey? Oh, yes, I have. In fact, I've completed it twice now. <laughs> have you? You must be a real expert now. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I can see that uh, you've made some beautiful mosaics. If I just come out of, the, out of the way here, could you tell us a little bit about how the alchemical journey inspired you to do this wonderful artwork? Well, I've always been interested in mosaic anyway. 
but um, the idea actually came to me when we did the um, the cancer the cancer weekend um, when we went to visit a well on the uh, on the cancer on the cancer walk. I realized that this is what I wanted to do, and what was interesting is that I don't have any water in my chart, and I've always had difficulty understanding the sign of cancer, and I could not relate to it very easily. But I found that it turned out to be one of my favorite signs, if not my favorite sign, and it was mm -hmm. such a huge revelation. It really stirred me up from within and I felt that I was going on to an inner journey of creativity. I felt that there was that spark of creativity and that's when it happened on the Cancer Weekend. So I decided that I would do the whole um, zodiac with the moors and the dog of Langport with a tour with it. Absolutely beautiful. How long did it take you to make this? Um, well, as you can well, to see, get as far as you have now. Um, quite a few months, but obviously mm. I don't work on it every day. Mm. So, um, but it, it's it's taking the time it's taking. Mm. Um, I see it as an organic process, and um, I'm enjoying the length of it. That's absolutely mm. fine. Um, and also because I'm doing more and more alchemical journey weekends, I get more and more insights. So, in a way, it's good for me to take my time. Yeah. And you're a co-facilitator now yes. on the course. And, yes. and I believe you do some wonderful altars yes. as well. We're going to have a little look at one of those now. Okay. So, Colette, this altar here, this is in celebration of Pisces, which, of course, is where we are now within yes. the zodiac cycle. Yes. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about uh, your inspiration for this altar? Um, well, basically, um, what I do with each altar, I look at the archetypes, I look at the energies, I look at the colours and the scent, and I just put the whole thing together. And then I create it on paper, and I create it in my head, and I might spend like two or three weeks thinking where this is going to go, and that would be better, and that colour would be better. So it's, it's a real visual, sensuous journey for me. Mm. And it's very fitting because I've got Venus in Taurus. So it's all about uh, expressing yeah. beauty, basically. Yeah. So, Celia, you're an author of several books and you've had a profound experience on the alchemical journey, I believe, and have a story to share with us. Yes, yes, I'd be very happy to. Um, I'm also an initiate of the alchemical journey and then I've done all 12 workshops and having just completed now in Pisces. And it's been absolutely an amazing year. And I just want to say why I chose to do the entire year, commit myself to this, was it was my, um, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2008 and then 2010 after all the grueling treatment and being the sort of person that looks for deeper meaning in all aspects, everything that happens to me in life has a, a message and a meaning, I decided to um, use the alchemical journey for a year as my year of what I call deep healing. So to connect with myself in a deeper, more meaningful way and come to know myself even more. And this is exactly what has happened, but in the most magical and enjoyable way as well. So um, I'd like to share with you a little bit of um, my own experience and how profoundly this has affected me in that it's not just getting to know yourself and, and accessing aspects of your creativity you might not have known about before, which is exactly what happened to me, but it's also about understanding emotional patterning, and for me, actually breaking through a long-standing emotional patterning, and I'll share this story with you now. In um, the sign of cancer, it was, on the actual pilgrimage in the cancer figure, Part of the silent walk is a long, long, straight stretch, a very dusty track. It was a really hot day, and I was very tired. It was a long walk for me at this point because I was still quite weak. And just putting one foot in front of the other, thinking, I can do this, I can get to the end of this. And not to make it sound too arduous, it was just that I was still quite weak. Suddenly into my head came the title for the book that I'm at, re at present writing which is actually an account of, of breast cancer. And it was just brilliant. So when we came to the Leo workshop, 
One of the um, projects we had to bring with us was um, a, something relating, something creative relating to a project we're engaged with just now. So I sat down with acrylics for the first time in my life and painted the cover of my book, right? Which was going to be called, the title that came to me was The Flaming Door. And I was very excited about this. Not that this is going to be the cover, but this is just my interpretation of what I felt about it. There was enough paint left over from this painting to paint this rather unusual figure, which I was actually a rock in this by the sea in Northumberland, which I took a photo of, and it's actually the water pouring over the rock, but I saw it as this incredible crack and wakes sort of sea monster emerging from the sea. Now, in the Leo workshop, we would have to bring these paintings with us, and so I did, in Julie, bring this one. But part of the Leo workshop was, it was quite extraordinary. Um, we had to walk an avenue one by one. We walked an avenue of rose petals to the music that John had picked out for us to a throne at the end. And the music John had picked out for me was um, Louis Armstrong's It's a Wonderful World, which was just really spooky for me because a couple of days earlier I thought that would be nice to have at my funeral. Not to sound too dour, dour, but I've changed my mind since then. Everybody has that one anyway. <laughs> so, But it was just extraordinary. We got to walk this avenue of rose petals up to this throne with everybody being hail, about, you know, you're about to be crowned, you're going up there and everybody's sort of blessing you and encouraging you on your journey. You sit on the throne, you're crowned, you're given a great robe, an orb and a scepter, and you get to stand up and say how you're going to rule your kingdom and the decrees you're going to make. And it's so empowering. And then when this is completed, you walk to the music back along the avenue and everybody's saying hail Queen Celia and all bowing and scraping and it's really kind of challenging too to somebody who was still working on their self-esteem. Mm. That night I had a dream. Now my emotional patterning for many years, for ever since more than 30 years that I can remember this dream happening, every, two or three times every month comes a dream where my ex-husband, father of my two younger children, somehow terribly abandons me, lets me down, is laughing in the background while I'm going through something very difficult. And I often wake up from this dream feeling totally bereft, totally let down, and crying. And why am I going through this? I'm married to a beautiful man now, and he would never let me down. Why am I still having these horrible nightmares? Well, that night, on the Saturday night, in the middle of this workshop, I had this dream that came now to its zenith, as it were, my ex was dressed sort of like me. He had my child, age two, taking him, the child from me. And the child, I could see, was terrified and didn't want to go. My ex was wearing a blonde wig, kind of a, an askew wig, and trying to talk in a wom woman's voice. And he was taking me, and he was pushing me into a bunch of bin bags, black bin bags. And I was getting all tangled up and wrapped up in these bin bags and being suffocated by them and disappearing into them. And then he calls the police in and tells them to take all this rubbish away, which includes me. And I'm sure they can see he's got this weird wig on that's all askew and it's got this man's voice. It can't be me. And surely they're going to rescue me out of these bin bags. But no, they carry me and they throw me out with all the rubbish. I woke up from this dream absolutely weeping, weeping, weeping. That day I go to the workshop. I didn't even want to go anymore. I was just so messed up and felt so terrible. I didn't even want to go on the Sunday, but I went along. And in the morning session, as we shared um, whatever we needed or wished to share, I found myself having to share this dream. And again, weeping and weeping. And I was especially angry because I had wanted to take along this picture as part of... Um, the day's creative project, mm -hmm. and I'd forgotten it. And I saw I was angry, and I was upset, and just all shaky. It was, it was just quite extraordinary. What I didn't realize at the time was this painting was actually showing some darkness in me emerging. Mm. We had the pilgrimage that day, and two days passed, and then I had another dream. And in the dream, again, my ex is doing something that's 
der deleterious to me. He's hurting me in some way or abandoning me in some way. And in the dream, for the first time ever, in, I'm talking about 30 years now, I turned to him and I said, I've had enough of this. I banish you. You are banished. That was last August. I have not had a dream of this type since. And now we are talking six, seven months later. And I feel honestly that that emotional patterning, which comes from a childhood wound, and I believe we all mm. carry this wound mm. because we all get abandoned some mm. way or another or, or hurt or, or, yeah. or lost some way or another. Yeah. But I honestly believe that that great wound has now been healed. And I do feel different mm. since then. And so that's that's the main story I would like to share of the many mm -hmm. stories I could tell you <laughs> about what transpired with me in the alchemical journey. And it's a blessing, mm. a healing journey. That's amazing. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing okay. that with us. That was obviously so profound for you. And it just shows that when we access mm. parts of ourselves that we try to keep hidden all the time, that real healing can occur. Thank you so much. Yes, it's a pleasure. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you now to uh, Gemini, alias Maggie. Maggie, that mask is absolutely wonderful, absolutely incredible. Could you tell us a little bit about what's inspired you to make these wonderful masks and tell us a little bit about them? I was doing the alchemical journey with, with John and I realised that um, one of the things that would help with the activities would be if there were some masks that could that people could wear whilst they were doing the, the dancing and the all, all the things that happen on the alchemical journey. Um, I I started making them um, and found that although they were quite difficult, they actually seemed to just happen in some ways. Some of them just almost fell on, onto the mask base. Others took a lot longer. Um, this one is Leo, and he was quite difficult. And th this was actually the second attempt at Leo, but I love him. He's just so flamboyant and bright and fiery, um, and quite a powerful mask. Um, Absolutely beautiful, the yeah. colours and the detail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the size of it, it's absolutely incredible. So did you have an, an, any artistic ability before you started this journey? I've, I've always been a person who could draw um, and had an eye for colour. Uh, but my sister and my mother were really the artists in the family and I didn't just didn't want to compete. So I just stepped back from it. Um, and I'd never done anything like this that was, was practical or handicrafts or anything. It was always there in the back of my abilities, if you like. So for you, this this journey has really brought out creative Absolutely. talents that you didn't Absolutely. know you had. And Absolutely. how wonderful. I, I started doing the journey, actually, because um, I had recently retired. And like a lot of retired people... Um, I was at a bit of a crossroads in my life and needed something to do and some means of finding a direction. Um, and I came to do the journey with John and this is the result. It's almost as though he gave me a key that I could use to unlock this this skill, this talent. I, I don't know what you would call it. This one is Pisces, by the way. Um, he's got shells on the top. Um, this one is another favourite of mine. This is Virgo. It's very beautiful, very earthy. Lovely one. And, and this one here, this, this is Scorpio. Scorpio with the sting in the tail. Mm. <laughs> She's actually, pe people tend to think of Scorpio as being quite scary. But actually, Scorpio can be very beautiful and very helpful and very kind because Scorpio can point certain things out to us that we wouldn't otherwise realise. I'm not an astrologer, by the way, <laughs> at all. <laughs> They're absolutely wonderful, aren't they? And when you look at the masks, they have such a life and an energy of their own. I actually think it's so empowering when you're, when you're living this part of the journey to put on a Scorpio mask really enhances your whole experience of that. I, I 
haven't actually done the journey using the masks, but I'm told that yes, they do. They are very, very empowering. Um, John has told me that they are very empowering for his for his subjects, and other people have said, "Oh, wow, this is wonderful." Yeah. Um, this what this one is Sagittarius. You can see the arrow and the horse tails. That's another one that I really love. I don't have any. Um, uh, water in my chart. I'm being Gemini. I'm sort of double Gemini actually with Aries. So I don't have any water and very little earth, I believe. Um, so I'm a bit floaty. <laughs> <laughs> in the nicest possible way. Thank I'm you. Sure. That's very kind of you. <laughs> but yes, I, I do find it quite hard to relate to some of the um, earthier um, signs and certainly the water signs I find very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, Maggie. Thank They're you. beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. So we've looked at some of the wonderful creative and practical arts that people have produced. I'm here now with, with Gwen Eli. Could you tell us your experience? Yes. Well, I'm only halfway through the astrology will, but uh, I'm doing the whole thing. And it's been a really subtle and profound experience for me because... It has allowed me to become more aware of some of my patterns or become more aware of some of my feelings. And it's, it's particularly powerful for me in the sense of um, qualities and discovering sites of myself that I've kind of hid or been intimidated or afraid of that are much more part of me than I suspected. And so... It's really been important for me in demystifying and allowing to see myself from a broader perspective and to understand how I feel and why do I feel this way and my relationship with life. And, um, and it completely amazes me how some very, very simple things that we do during the course mm -hmm. are taking me in such deep place. And, and I love working this way. It's really my way of working mm -hmm. because it completely bypasses the rational so there's no thinking involved. And uh, being an air sign, I'm very good with thinking. So if I want to go any deeper, I have to let go of that. And and this workshop just completely takes me to a place that allows me to face things that, with words I might not go to or, you know, just... And you've been expressing this musically, I believe. Yes, well, I've, I was already starting to be involved in making songs, which are more storytelling, and I, I work in a very intuitive way. I make special kind of songs, actually, that I do for people that are based on the essence of a person. Mm -hmm. And with the alchemical journey, I thought, wouldn't that be great to do a song that would represent the sign? So I've only done three of them. Uh, the one I did for Capricorn is kind of my favorite one, because I just, I realized how how that was part of me, a part that I really like. So the, the song was kind quite easy to do. They're not always easy because they ask me to go in places that I'm not entirely familiar with or haven't integrated very well. But I do my best to be really archetypal and not put my own thoughts in it. Mm -hmm. And and since I already do intuitive work in this way, so they're more um, there to capture the essence or the, 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 the energy of a sign so that ultimately at some point there will be to be worked with. It's not music to be listened to. Mm -hmm. It's done, um, I, I tap into my emotional level to do these. I only go through building a song with how it feels. And um, so they're to help going into the emotional layers. And they're more of a storytelling to take you into a landscape. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's quite fascinating to... Um, I'll have a whole album of it. <laughs> <laughs> and do you come from a musical background, or this has purely been brought out by following the alchemical journey? No, this is... Well, I, I was... No, I don't I don't come from a musical background. Um, I had no idea I could do music, actually. This came as mm -hmm. quite of a surprise mm -hmm. to me. Um, the alchemical journey is exactly the direction that I want to go into, mm -hmm. because I find going beyond words extremely powerful. I've done some work, not the same, but different kind of work. And so it's completely inspiring where I want to go with being able to create. I, I don't create for myself. I want to create as a way for people to have tools. And um, the alchemical journey gives me the perfect setup because I so, I'm so in tune with what the workshop is about. And for the song to be an emotional 
um, tool to, to go to places, to, to get an inner experiential understanding of something is what they're, they're um, meant for. So it's giving me a perfect opportunity to um, deepen ideas because I've not really put myself out there yet. So it's, it's a great way for me to go through the wheel and at the same time find all in me to tap into who I want to become, who I'm growing. That's what's happening for me mm -hmm. through, the, through the wheel is um, parts of myself that I've been intimidated by are bubbling up and are being integrated and, and completely supported because with my creativity I'm going exactly where I want to go, which is making things that can be used for people to go on an emotional journey. Welcome, Vicky, and your wonderful harp. How exciting. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey, your own chemical journey? Because obviously you're a musician. Yes. Um, I'm a musician and a teacher, and the last 10 years I've come into being a healer as well. For me, they're not separate. Mm -hmm. um, music is a teacher and a healer. So it's taught me the vibrations, teaches me all my learnings as I travel on. So, um, and the art chemical journey became very much part of that whole story for me. And I believe you'd already written some music but you didn't realise at the time that that was relevant to each of the signs of the zodiac. Not at all. I didn't really have much understanding of astrology until John invited me aboard his wonderful journey and um, about halfway through when we got to Libra so much information kind of was coming in that I suddenly felt I was being drawn to put together my own journey, I call it a musical journey around the cosmos. So um, it's still 12, 12 stages, the astrological seasonal year maps again, the journey of the human lifetime. So I talk about each stage and I sing a song for each stage and when I kind of look through my repertoire I realise I already had a song mm. for, for each section and I, it kind of came together about Sagittarius. Um, speak, you know, the truth, putting out your truth and finding your mission and everything, and, and it was ready as we come, came to a close in Pisces to perform to the group, so that was the birthing of it, which was from, wonderful for me, because yes. I am Pisces, and it's, Pisces carried the energy of, of, of all the years that it was amazing to come to the end and come to have this work to, to show for what I'd learnt and kind yeah. of honouring the gift that I've been receiving. It was very wonderful. Amazing, thank you. And you're going to play the Pisces music that you've written for us now, yes. I believe. And how apt by the Pisces altar, and you're, you're, you yourself are a Pisces, I and we're in Pisces, Pisces, Pisces at the moment. So, uh, yes, thank you. It's good to music, it's my, my thank you to the music. <laughs> Falling 
good inside. So we've had a marvellous journey today, a multi-sensory experience meeting some lovely people and to close our show we're here at Glastonbury Tour. So John and Anthony, why have you brought us to Glastonbury Tour? Well, Apart from the obvious of it being beautiful. Yeah, well it's a, very, it's a very special and unique place and it's the highest point on the Aquarius figure in the, the, uh, the zodiac of, that's round Glastonbury. I mean I've got the map here, I mean Aquarius is like a bird and it's got the tail where the abbey is and the wings you can see here and this part here which is the head of the bird, the Aquarius bird, looking back is the tour so we're actually standing about here now looking at this extraordinary natural feature it isn't man-made, it may be man-altered slightly you can see those sort of terraces on it and with this beautiful tower of St Michael on the top and remember this bird is, is mystically a, a kind of legendary eagle and it's fascinating that the, the highest sculpture on the very top of the tower made by the monks of Glastonbury Abbey of course is an eagle. It's almost as if somehow they knew yeah. or if they didn't know certainly um, you know uh, it's there by one of those synchronicities. Yeah. But it, it really represents Aquarius and you know we're either in or just about to enter or we are entering the Aquarian age mm. with all the kind of excitement that Aquarius brings and that's very much the spirit of Glastonbury and you know that's that's where we are isn't it? Mm. One of the things I love about the tour and um, it's, it's so me so mesmerizing the tour but it, when you when when you get to live here and spend a lot of time here you realize that it has so many different personalities depending on which which way you come at it from. So as we're looking at it here, you know, it's got this long sweep. But there are places if you're coming in from the north, for example, it's just like a straight up and down. It's a it's 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 a very very different, like a completely different mm -hmm. hill. And and all the different directions that you come in at it from, it shows you a different side of itself. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think very much like the zodiac. And you know, the zodiac has all these different sides to it. Mm -hmm. And it it's um. I think, I think the tour, in a way, in, in that sense, sort of represents or facilitates or supports our alchemical journey really mm. beautifully. Mm. Yeah. And it must have one of the world prizes for um, being on more book covers than anything <laughs> imagine. <laughs> when you look at it, you think, I've seen that somewhere before, you know, where have I seen that before? Oh, that's Glastonbury Tour, and you see it all over the place. Yeah, and uh, so you can see why. It's yeah. quite photogenic, isn't it? And it's, and it's, not difficult to, it's not difficult to see why Glastonbury would become such a centre for people over thousands of years. Yeah. With, such yeah. a feature, such a unique yeah. feature. I mean, there are, 
There's no other hill like it in in London. It's just very special, isn't it? It is. Yes, you're right. I think special is the the, the operative word. Mm -hmm. This has been such a fantastic uh, journey for me too today, discovering everything that you do within your Zodiac tours and the alchemical journey and hearing people speak of their experience. It sounds like such a profound journey for people. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. So if you would like to know more, have a look at our show notes. All the links will be on there to everything you've seen today. Uh, You can find us on Facebook and, of course, at www.thelightandenergychannel.tv. So enlightened energy from me, Claire Wiles. Goodbye.